Uh, good afternoon. Uh, honored to be here and to be able to contribute some of the historical relevance of the uh, artwork and how it intersects with the politics of the Black Panther Party and some of the more recent work I've done as well as uh, some of the travels that have been connected to the past and present work. Um, first, I want to show a, a five, about a seven minute uh, video done by AIG, American Institute of Graphic Arts, when they gave me uh, a lifetime award. Uh, that was, uh, came about through the chapters of young people who would invite me to come and do presentations. And they were the ones who nominated me for the award not the governing body itself, but it was the young people who were different chapters out here in different areas where uh, have invited me to talk about the historical work and the politics behind it. Now I'm going to uh, start the uh, PowerPoint presentation. Um, some of it has a little bit to with the uh, materials that were used during that time to show you, give you an idea of how the publications were put together, the materials that I used during that time. So I'm going to, uh, let me see if I can bring it up myself here. Uh, okay, this is uh, the book. We used to use the format materials. It's a product that when you've seen the artwork and you've seen the textures in the black and white images, that was how we got the, uh, uh, the I got the depth in the art as for just a black and white line artwork. Uh, because of, uh, it was, economical and it was an easy way, uh, a more convenient way of uh, making the contrast without going through the whole uh, pre-press process to get to that point. Uh, you could do it and you have your art ready for camera ready so when it went to press. And this was the book we used. Uh, unfortunately, next time I'm going to put the other books in there, but this was one we used because it was the cheapest. But it was also the best because the fact that it was had the, the line under it where you could apply your art, which I'll show you, and you could cut out each letter. Some of those sheets, you had to rub them off. If you rubbed them off too hard, they could crack or they'd peel up, those kinds of things. This is the best and most sturdiest one. Uh, these sheets used to cost, I think, about a dollar, dollar fifty. The others cost two fifty or three fifty, depending on what, what company you got them from. But this was the cover of that book itself. This is the in, insight showing you different fonts and type, type, text you could use in the context of your headlines. And next to it, you may see a number, little number of a, a page number. And so you just go to that page, and when you went to that page, you can see the, 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 top, the fonts. And it gives you the actual size of those that you are, want to use. Uh, you, you give the, uh, the vendor that number. They go through the file and they pull out that sheet for you with that with that whole sheet for you, and it would have the it would have the alphabets on it, like that, a full page. This is this is one I had left over from when I worked at the Black Press, and from some I had left over also when I went to City College, <laughs> so that long ago. And uh, so you see them there, and you cut them out to make up your words, and show you an example of that. And this is the book, as you see in the center fold of t different textures and different patterns. The same thing, you choose the code underneath the uh, page you want, or the sheet you want. Then you, uh, there you give that to the vendor, there you go, and they would pull up a sheet. This shows you an example of that. And here's the, uh, it would about to be the code number for this sheet that was on that page. But this is from Lettratone. This is not from uh, Lettraset. This is a, another one that somebody probably gave me and I just kept it. But here is give you a sample of using of making your words together from those sheets. And then you all you have to do once you make it, you can cut this out and you can paste it wherever you want it on your on your art. So this is how we were in the initial days, most of the headlines in the paper, maybe two or three, four or five uh, pa uh, issues of the paper uh, and uh, and all, some of the art that you will see. Here I also did community graphics uh, for the community and for friends of mine I had to put together using that again, they, they type and sometimes I could get stuff typeset but I had to cut it and paste it in places. A friend of mine who sold the different products here gave me copies, actual copies of the of materials uh, and I had to illustrate them. I had to do the ink drawings and put the whole thing together. So these were illustrations that I did of the actual products. She used to sell at the Berkeley Free Market many years ago. 
his uh, uh, cover of a friend of mine who also who wanted, was, uh, wanted to, uh, this guy A.J. Roji was South West Africa, who was a well-known palm wine singer, and he wanted me to do the design for the album cover and back. Uh, so he just gave me the photographs and the, the text, and I had to put it together. So, but if people ask me, I'm retired, I don't do that no more. <laughs> Too much stress, deadline. Only my, only my deadlines. I can put them down, come back to them a year later, but obviously you have to do it right then and there. Oh, this was a friend of mine also who had a uh, beauty shop and wanted me to do the uh, announcement for this uh, uh, sale that they were having and what have you. And so he had, and same thing, all this is to cut out them patterns, all this comes from the sheets. And you, you know, which after a while you figure out how to put it together. Uh, this is an illustration I had to do to go with this photograph. So, and the whole thing. So you, 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 these are the design elements and concept as well. He was a friend of mine who uh, also uh, had a contract with the post office where she did um, a mailing, a bulk mailing contract agreement. And she was celebrating her first anniversary. And she wanted me to design the, I did the, uh, design the logo, did the whole thing again, using the same thing, illustrations, all this combination, went into putting this together as well. So these are just some of the, uh, also the work that I did, but also we had a community printing and graphic service that did the same things in connection with the community as well as in the party. So now I go into the Panther, and I talked earlier in the uh, presentation uh, about where the symbol of the Panther came from the South in, in 1965 when the Voters' Right Act was passed. Uh, in Lowndes County, Alabama, you had uh, a county that was about uh, 80,000, uh, predominantly black, African-American, about 20,000 uh, were white, but you had these racist, the Bo Connors and them who ran the county, who intimidated and threatened the workers, blacks who worked for them uh, as sharecroppers and what have you. Then you had SNCC, Students for the Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and those who went to South, to Lowndes County, to enlighten and educate those about the black folks there about their voting rights. They didn't want to be a part of the Democratic Party, nor did they want to be a part of the Republican Party. So they started the Lowndes County, uh, Lowndes County uh, organization, I think, Lowndes County Fre Freedom, pardon me? Yeah, Lowndes County Freedom Organization. And uh, they had to have an icon. Just like the rooster here, that was a, that was for the racist, which was the Democratic Party, and it had to, and the rooster stood for white supremacy, and so they chose the Panther, and how they came about choosing the Panther is that they went to the seen these high school sports teams, which had different animals as their mascots, and they chose the one that had the Panther. So the Panther symbol comes from the South during the Civil Rights Movement. And uh, we got permission early on after the second, third paper because of the respect that we had for SNCC and what they were doing to use the Panther. And we used it and then re re remixed it, redesigned it because this one was too, too, looked too healthy. So we made ours a little more punier and thinner and what have you. <laughs> and, and over the years. <laughs> this is the actual photograph in Lowndes County. Uh, vote November 8th, pull the lever for Black Panther and go home. So there's a whole publication that was out on that at that time as well. So now I'm going to call it some American history. Here is the more recent image that I've designed of the Black Panther image itself, more recent one. Uh, I do have images for sale, don't have them with me, but if people are interested, they can contact me and get in touch with me because I do, do sell prints uh, uh, from, all, all from time to time. So that's just to start it off with. Some of these images I will talk about, some of them I'll just uh, phase over in that, in that, in that way, but uh, I'll give you some history behind many of them. I chose this one because of the uh, pig icon. This was the first pig image that I was given to draw when we used to work on the paper out of Elders Cleaver's house, studio apartment. Uh, Huey and Bobby would come over from Oakland and we were talking politics and they was talking about the pig and what have you. And so they gave me this image, this clip art, which I retouched re up and refined as the first pig. And each week we were going to put the badge number of the pig that was harassing and intimidating people in the community on that pig drawing. And uh, so 
what, what I did after that, I kind of gave some thought to it. I was just at home and I thought about it and I said, what I'm going to stand it up on two hoofs, keep the snort, the tail, and begin to put the bandolier around it, had a badge and, on it and uh, the flies around it, and that became the icon of the pig. What is the pig? Why the pig? Well, the pig was the pig in, in relationship to how Huey and Bobby had defined it was a low, as you see in this uh, uh, statement here, a low natured beast that has no regard for law, justice, or the right of people, a creature that bites the hand that feeds it, a foul to prey producer usually found masquerading as the victim of an unprovoked attack. But also a pig in American culture, as you observe it, is wallows in the filth, the dirt, and all those things. So in that context, it was meant in that way as well. Of course, we understood that in other cultures, it was a survival food and what have you. But in the context of the U.S. and what we were talking about, this is how it, it, we uh, visualized it. It was visualized. This here is our uh, image that uh, began to spark uh, our call for community control lease in this country, which had never been done before. Uh, this was when little Bobby Hutton, the very first Panther, was murdered April, I think April 6, uh, uh, 1968. I would think it was four days after Dr. Martin Luther King had been murdered in Memphis, Tennessee, a two day. Uh, then um, uh, we began to call for community control of police. Uh, we worked with the uh, Oakland uh, Progressive uh, Board of, Board of uh, Supervisors, I believe it was, uh, in regards to getting it on the ballot at that time. And uh, uh, when it went to vote, it only lost by one vote, but it brought attention to the need for an oversight board, but one that was not controlled by the police, but by the community, that would be one that would make it relevant. And so what you hear today and what you have been hearing maybe for the past 10, 15 years or whatever, uh, this was an, uh, inspired by the Black Panther Party. What was the significance of Little Bobby Hutton? Why is he such a symbol of the Black Panther oh, Party? Little Bobby Hutton was uh, because he was the very first Panther. He was mentored by Huey and Bobby before he even got into the Black Panther Party. But when he joined the Black Panther Party, I think it was about 15, 15 and a half, they had to go get permission from his mother for him to join the Black Panther Party. And she agreed and gave, him, gave, them, uh, him, uh, gave permission for him to become a member of the Black Panther Party. And he was the very first Panther killed uh, by the police, uh, uh, by the state. He was the treasurer too, right? Yes, he was the first treasurer of the Black Panther Party. As, yes. Here's one, uh, this is 1968. 1968, there's a lot of documentary, a lot of film, a lot of uh, ex exhibitions that have been done around that history in that period in 1968. And it because of the many rebellions, if you look at historically, there were over two or 300 rebellions in this country, all across the country in 1968. Uh, I used the word KKK, which I didn't create, but I thought it was relevant to use that in the context of using the word America in, with this art. And this is talking about in regards to the rebellions and the police uh, abuse, murders that were taking place in the country. And, and, and the response to that, in many ways, it says nowhere, nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. It's hell outside, it's hell inside. So this in, indicates that. Here's another one where we uh, begin to coin the word, particularly elders, uh, uh, using the biblical word Babylon to describe America. And in 1968, you, uh, you had, I did little illustrations with a clip art of the Pentagon with the pig standing in the middle of the Pentagon ready for overkill, missiles between the toes, blood sucking vulture with dollar signs on the butt of the gun, on his eyes. You got the pig with dollar signs on his glasses, drool, money drooling out of his mouth, hand grenades, lynch rope, all those things. But in 1968 in New Haven, Connecticut, that's when Bobby Seale and Erica Huggins were, were set up and framed for the um, the uh, murder of a Black Panther, which they were eventually exonerated of, and the agent provocateurs were found guilty. Uh, in in, uh, in uh, Connecticut, you had, uh, that was in Connecticut, in Kent, Ohio, at Kent State University, you had four white students who were sh shot and murdered by the National Guard for protesting against the war in Vietnam. You had Jackson, Mississippi, 
You had uh, different uh, Augusta, Georgia, Rutgers, many universities where black students were. There were actual battles and some gun confrontations on, on those kind of campuses during that period. Um, you also had the war in Vietnam, the uh, things going on in Cambodia, Laos, and the struggle of the Palestinians. All these and more were taking place in 1968, yes. What was the importance of why you connected local politics, national politics, and international politics? Uh, because different? we were internationalists in, in, in essence. Uh, our, our scope was broader than just the Black Panther Party. Our paper always had an international section in the middle of it and dealing with international issues in support of other uh, uh, oppressed people struggles around the world. And so that was uh, in the context of the Black Panther Party's uh, outlook political outlook. Again, 1968, that was when John Carlos and Tommy Smith went to the Olympics and gave the, uh, the Black Power salute. Uh, there were many discussions, a lot of people didn't weren't aware of, in the community. Uh, where, before that, where they had came and there were discussions, I didn't go with some, but some Panthers were involved, some students from San Francisco State, others were involved. And what they could do when they went, the Olympians could do when they went to the uh, Olympics in regards to expressing their concerns about the uh, human rights violations against the uh, African-American community. Uh, they, they weren't able to come to an agreement, a consensus. So when they went, different uh, Olympians did different things. That's what Tommy Smith and John Carlos, when they went there, gave the uh, black power sign. In 1982, the struggle continued with, uh, with the, at the Olympics. You had Vince Matthew and Wayne Collette and they call it ignored the tradition at Munich Olympic. When they won the race, they stood on the, on the podium and they didn't give a salute. They didn't put their hand over the heart. They just stood there. One was barefooted and the whole bit and hands on the hip. This is in defiance of the relationship at the Olympics. This is the back page of that particular uh, uh, paper where it says the IDs and them both standing there, the whole bit. This is one I did after that called The Olympics. And they got the uh, runners on the ground running the race. They come to the line. They stand up on the podium. They hold up the flag. And when it's over, a nigger is a nigger is a nigger. No matter what you achieve as a person of color, black, when you go back to home, you're still going to be profiled. Whether you're a doctor, or you're a lawyer, or on the street, or you're black, you're going to be profiled. And the fact of that is this, this recent mayor, who's the mayor of New York, who made that uh, agreement to discontinue the program in New York, where they had over 600,000 blacks and brown people who had been profiled over many, many years, stopped and searched for no other reason but because of the color of their skin. And thereafter, when they did, and it, uh, I think some kind of uh, 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 investigative report, they found out that less than 1% of those who blacks who were stopped, and brown and black who were stopped had anything of contraband. 45% of the whites who they didn't stop had contraband. This is again in the early days showing our internationalism through the illustration of the pig being choked, saying get out of the ghetto, get out of Africa, get out of Asia, get out of Latin America, US imperialism. Here again, it's all the same. Local police, National Guards, Marines. Today it all comes under Homeland Security. I mean, and that is under, it's militarized. Uh, we talked about it then, but Ferguson brought it to the attention of the world today in relationship to when they brought in all that military equipment into Ferguson after they had murdered, the local police had murdered the young brother there. And now, as we, everybody, many of you may know me, you may not know, all the local police departments all across the country is having access to all this military equipment that they're buying up in the community, in the, in, in the police departments. Ha, 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 good old American peace. That's a little missile going into the globe, the world globe. And you got Henry Kissinger, who was then the Secretary of State, and Richard Nixon, who was the president. War criminals then, 
what was what was the um can you go back to that last one what was going on at that time for especially well, us again, that's younger this is again in in relationship to the wars that were going on all over the world and the third world and the uh this is what this represented that. but i'm saying which were some of the wars vietnam what yeah, were some vietnam of the others? was the was the and you had cambodia laos kind of covert war going on in laos where they slot bombed and slaughtered a lot of laotians during that time yeah you still had, and you had the struggle of the Palestinians. You had the str liberation struggles in Africa still going on. Yeah. This one, this then we created a little rat as an avaricious, greedy business person, and other, otherwise as an icon. And here you had it winding up its little toys, military toys, sending them off to war. They went to war, realized they were fighting their own government, and they came back. And many of them joined the Black Panther Party. You had a lot of ex-Vietnam veterans who joined the uh, Black Panther Party. Can you name some, just for reference? Hey, uh, Ger Geronimo Jajaga Pratt, who was uh, uh, in prison for a crime he did not commit for over 27 years. And we were able to get him out. Uh, and who recently died about eight, nine, ten years ago. Was one of those who was uh, a member of the uh, Black Panther Party. And there were m many, many others who came in and joined the Black Panther Party. And we used to use the GI loan to buy houses so the comrades could live. <laughs> and, uh, and here was uh, one talking about peace with honor. There were those who refused to go. There were those who went, to v who went in exile, those who went to prison, those who went underground, and some were not left out the country. And this was called peace with honor. Yes. Artistically speaking, where did you get the style? Who were you looking at artistically and technically to come up with the style and the colorings for particular pictures? Well, I came from my own style uh, in the context of uh, the way I had illustrated and developed my illustration. And some of these styles I used as when I went to City College, I took up commercial art. But commercial art is one that prepares you for a job in the job market. And when I used to do these styles, they said, well, they're, they're not commercial enough to use in your portfolio. <laughs> so I had to put them to the side and come back to them when I got politically involved. And so, so that's, it was something that was always there. It's just something I developed, yeah. But to put, understanding the production aspect of how to put it together, how to apply it, came from the experience and the, the, uh, the, the, met the training that I had at City College, but also it came from working in small print shops. Because when you work in small print shops, they too have to get, they too get contract jobs the same as the high-end print shops do with all the equipment. But the, high, but the small shops don't have a lot of that equipment. But they know how to manipulate the equipment they have to get the results. So you learn how to cut corners and deal with things with less uh, in that context. So that also was a, a, a good part of my experience of the visualizing and being to see how to get things done. Here again is showing what war does to human beings, the psychological impact of war and families, the substance, all that's called US government approved. Today, what, you still have about two veterans a day committing suicide. You go out in the streets, a lot of the homeless is out there, of vets. Yes. How much latitude did Huey, Bobby, and Eldridge give you? How much of an idea did they give you before you drew it? Because I mean, the images are so rich with, with politics. Uh, I, well, I was a reflection of the po of politics and inspired by what we were involved in. But I had the green light. Uh, to do whatever I wanted to do. Uh, it was early on that they used to check to make sure I understood the politics. When they seen I understood the politics, I could do whatever I chose to do, except for maybe a, a handful of times they had asked me to do a Pacific illustration or something. But what would be an example of when they say, we need a graphic for this, how would they come at you? Oh, no, they wouldn't ask, they just let me do. And every week I just had a lab to just do it. That was it. No, no, uh, no, uh, no, uh, no enter, no, no uh, concern about what it was I did. It just let me. I just had the green light to be creative. 
Here's one saying, free the GIs. Our fight is not in Vietnam. Uh, the GI, the, the Vietnamese wasn't cause of unemployment. The Vietnamese wasn't cause of inferior education. The Vietnamese wasn't cause of indecent housing. The Vietnamese weren't lynching us. Our fight was not in Vietnam. Our fight was right here in the US. Here's that same paper when we sh shared it with the Bastia, Bastia, the La Sieta de la Raza, which was the seven young San Francisco Latino brothers who were charged with the murder of a San Francisco policeman. And they had no way to plead their case. So we were able to get them uh, a lawyer that we had at that time, Charles Gary, well-known lawyer, was a, to, to uh, defend them. We also shared our paper with them to talk so they could plead their case. We did about four or five papers with them. And eventually they were found not guilty of, of killing the San Francisco policeman. But can you imagine, they would have been in prison to, to death or in the gas chamber if, if they not had no, because they didn't have any resources and they would not have had the assistance or help come from the Black Panther Party. What year was this? This was, uh, what, what year is that paper? That's uh, 19... No, uh, yeah, 72, about 72, around there, around that time, yes. It could have been literally about 70, 72, this paper here. But I thank you, I'll remember that next time. Here's a, a, one of the second papers of that that we put together with, with La Ciet, La C the, the Seven. Here's an um, uh, image I did. Uh, it's a uh, U.S. imperialist nursing all his little piglets. And all those little piglets were directly involved or involved in the colonization of other people in the world. What was the importance of political education? I mean, we see, we see it in the pictures, but how did the Black Panther Party look at international education and the, the, their members knowing what was going on in current events? Well, it was based on our solidarity and our practice. Uh, it was important because it gave you a worldview and it gave in, informed the community who had very, very narrow, not narrow, limited perspective because of the daily concerns that they were confronted with and not looking at the broader scope of what's going on in the world. So when they, uh, the community was in, uh, were inspired and looked to us to get uh, another perspective on what was going on in the world, we could share this information to give them insight in a broader perspective. That was the importance of the uh, political education in the context of the community, but it was also important in, in, in the context of the Black Panther Party itself, so that we would all be consistent in understanding where our position was on, on political issues in the world our political educations would, would, would share that because we had required to read the paper and sometimes discuss some of the issues that were in the paper as well as a part of the political education class. Now, that means that everybody was maybe on the same level, but we, everybody would able to get something from it in, in the context of what we uh, as an organization were uh, expressing. Here again is one is dealing with the Zionist puppet state of Israel, the U.S. imperialists, uh, uh, the apartheid system uh, uh, today, apartheid uh, Israel, the government itself, where you have the U.S. feeding dollar bills today, what, 30, over $38.5 billion given to Israel just for the purpose of buying military equipment and that they cannot buy, and they made an agreement that they cannot buy from anybody else but them if they give them that money. Also, the Saudis, what they gave them, what, a, 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 a 20 million, 20 billion, I'm excuse me, I'm talking about million billions of, 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 of dollars. So, and when we look at that, we're looking at it in the context of what today is. This, this is a, a military economy that we're living under. 60, six, over 60% 60 is of, of a military. So, and, you, you, and we wonder why we, there's no jobs. <laughs> you wonder why we have high employment. Boycott lettuce. This is one day Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers. They were on their way to Sacramento 
and they were protesting against the chemicals that were being sprayed on the lettuce in the field that were harming the farm workers. And we heard them out in front of our headquarters, and we, heard, and we went out there, there was Cesar Chavez with the other farm workers. And we asked them what was going on, and they explained what I just mentioned. But they said they were hungry and needed a place to eat. So we worked it out so we could take them to our school, which is about 30 blocks from my headquarters then, which was on 85th and International Way, which was called East 14th Street then, to around 60th uh, and International Way. And uh, we marched with them there uh, in our school, and we were able to uh, feed them, the 50 farm workers, and uh, to show our solidarity there after the next paper uh, created this design and has some photographs in it to show our solidarity with that particular issue that it was Yes. How did the Black Panther Party see itself benefiting from um, solidarity and uh, principal unity rather than racial chauvinism? Say it again. How did the Black Panther Party see itself benefiting politically from solidarity and principal unity rather than racial chauvinism? Well, we, we're educating the whole community. We're showing everybody uh, this the, the reality, you know, and the, 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 the world's interconnected and everybody's interconnected. You know, it's about class struggle, but it's also about race. But we're trying to show the community in relationship to the, uh, pr other, uh, that the people are oppressed, other ethnic groups and people are oppressed in this country as well, and, uh, in, in, in the context of how the Black Panther Party showed our solidarity around those issues. Yeah. This is one called point number one of the points of the ten point platform program. We want decent housing fit for the shelter of human beings. Here you got the, the, the mother protecting a, a baby from the rodents, and the rodents are coming around, sneaking up and attacking the baby. It was meant to be a provocative and to bring attention to that issue. But at the same time, when you do these kinds of images, sometimes you have to have a you can't just and as an illustrator, you can't just illustrate it. But you have to be able to feel it so that you can get the feel into the lines and the artwork that you're doing. So you just can't sit down and just, you have to be able to feel this, what's going on. You have to be able to feel how, the, how she feels, or what she's trying to do, or what's going on. And you'll see that even more in some of the other images as well. Did you, did you choose color? Like, how did you use color in particular? Did co color express different feelings? It, well, what happened is that uh, they had a, a we had a list of colors that the printer had. And because we want the paper to look different each week, we use a different color each week. And then we cycle those, then we come back again to those colors. So that's the way we usually ran it. And that's just one color. But it see is again, is learning and understanding how you give it a contrast to make it to look full of more than one color. And that's using tints of the color, overlaying in the, in, in the tints and contrast. But that's just one color. It's just in there. It's, it's over, overlaid with different screen tints and stuff. And so when you visualize it, you have to be able to visualize it then. You can play with it on the computer now and do those things, but you had to be able to visualize in advance what it was going to look like. And then sometimes it didn't come out pretty. And, but, and then you learn from that, and then you move forward. Here's going to, it says, whatever's good for the person has got to be bad for us. This is when the first unmanned uh, space adventures, what they were going into, and uh, you have to, it would be in, this is like playing the devil's advocate and, and, and the reality of what could possibly be at, if they were ever to get uh, colonized in space, masses of people to go up there, what would it be like? And so this is uh, the, the pig spaceship, and you got the pig out on the deck, say, hey, handle them slaves with care. We're going to need them for Mars, Pluto, and all those other planets. Then you got the, uh, the slaves getting off the play, slave ship, and they're saying, I knew we should have stopped this ship before it got off the ground. <laughs> and then you got the slave pig over here, master over here, saying, hey, have no slaves we care. We're going to need them for Mars, Pluto, and all those other planets. So, and then it just so happened one evening, though, I was looking at the news, and they had this guy talking about space. And it came to the question, of housing in space. And they said they were already visualizing the possibility of housing and possibility of housing prisoners and all this stuff in space. So you got to understand they, they, that this mindset 
it's not just about kindness and humanitarian, humanitarian kind of thing when you talk about space. You know, there's other possibilities that you have to look at, you know, in relationship to what might be you, make the, when they be able to colonize folks in space, uh, what have you. What was the Panthers' mindset towards profanity in the paper? Say it again, profanity? Uh-huh. Oh, well, in the beginning, uh, there was profanity. But then uh, when Huey was in prison, and then somebody took the paper to Huey, because it was an article that, and people were talking about it, and Huey said, well, he didn't say don't do it. He said, well, Malcolm X never used profanity, and he got his message across. So that made it clear then that that wasn't what he wanted in the paper. Here again is um, one, at the, uh, after that, like when you had blacks move into a community and you had white flight that moved out. This is like when the whites went up onto the moon and they got there and they said, ah, oh, whites on it at last. <laughs> the racist. Uh, this saved the children. Was that in the paper? Uh, the yes, this was in the paper. Mm -hmm. This was uh, a, a wash with a pen and graphite pencil, a combination of wash, graphite pencil, and a little uh, pen, pen and ink in, in the, integrated together. How much time did you put into these portraits that were in the paper? Well, sometime I could, uh, when I had time, and I had a, a, a cadre working with me, then uh, I could focus, and I could do it maybe a day, day and a half, depends on what it was, or less, depending on what it was. How much time did it take for, to you, for you guys to lay out the paper, period? Uh, well, you had to have the proof. You had, first, you had to have the articles come in. They had to be approved, and they had to be the typesetting and all that stuff. So it would take about, we maybe started on, if a paper came out on a Wednesday, we maybe started on a uh, the following week, Friday or Saturday, after all the materials got together, uh, the pre-press stuff, for camera work for the photography and stuff that had to go into the paper. So you, you, you're talking about an intense uh, period of uh, maybe four or five days. Mm -hmm. And then uh, understanding that as we evolved, uh, well, when it first started off, it took us days and weeks to get the paper out. It maybe didn't come out on time. And maybe some of the articles said continue here, but when you went there, they weren't now. <laughs> so you had all that in the, in the early, early, early papers. But then we began to critique and evaluate, and we had to get it right. And so we had great, better proofreading, all those things, and it became consistently right on time with the continuations in the correct places, all those things, yeah. And so we had a schedule that we had to get out because not only did the comrades have to work on the paper, when they finished working on the paper, they had to go do other work in other areas as well. This again, save the children. I mean, these images here can be anywhere in the world today. Here again is one, but this one here, you can see how I used those prefabricated materials to get the wood feeling and the pattern feelings in the back and the tones on, on the figure, because this was just an ink drawing, black and white ink drawing, and integrated with all those things in to get that feeling to it. But also, I didn't play with, in the context of scale. I did things on how you feel, how they felt. A broom don't come up to your knee like that. <laughs> You may have a rat that big, but you don't have room. <laughs> this is when we. This is one was when we were going to the uh, called public housing uh, USA. This is when we were going to um, to the o Oakland City Council meetings and talking about and we were working in the, on the housing projects and working with the community, and we were uh, and so therefore these were some of the concerns that I heard. And based on the illustration, the photographs that we were able to take, I was able to interpret those photographs with, con with text and pull text and write text based on what, they, what it was about. And uh, can I use your, your, your mic for a minute so I can walk over here? Thank you. Because here, what it says, uh, it says, uh, Public Housing USA, story by the people, illustrations by Emory Douglas, hello, Public Housing Authority. This is a tenant of your slum, house, slum housing calling you again. I have rats and roaches in my apartment. It needs extermination, effective extermination. 
I have a stopped up toilet and leaky sink. My house hasn't seen paint, have my house hasn't been painted in years. We need more garbage pickup. My children have no place to play. Stairs that need repair are hazard to our health. Stop the police harassment. Years pass, nothing happens. Action to be continued. So this was based on the, uh, based on the, uh, the concerns of the community. And, and, try, and then you I write out a storyboard and try to write it and then eliminate some of the wording to get it simple enough to go with the illustrations and what have you. And this was a three-part series that we did. Here again is Richard Nixon, when I think he had a cabinet, black cabinet member, and I think they coined uh, the word black capitalism. He said if they, Nixon and them coined black capitalism, it ain't worth nothing. And, and, and so that's what this illustration comes by. If you cap, chop down US imperialism, black capitalism ain't nothing but a weed. And tree gonna fall right over there. This is one that's showing fatherly love and determination to the young, youngster. Here again is another one. And I think it says Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, California, Chicago, New York, America. Freedom is a constant struggle. This is a photo collage. I used to look through a lot of books and have recall when sometimes I want to do something I could know where to pull from the images to get the message across. Here again is one is justice. When I, when I get to the new ones, you will see uh, a remix of this one and a few others. This one says, uh, freedom, I just want to testify. I'm not going to sit around any longer. I got freedom on my mind. That's what it says. Now, when you buy the borders, you could also buy these decorative borders for certificates and all these kinds of things. Well, I use them for whatever I chose to. That's what, I, you know, I never, some of them tell you to use them for wood and this. I use them, you use them however you get the message across and what it feels like in your art, in the, in the message as well. We shall survive without a doubt. These are young panther cubs, but they're in their 40s now. Where did you um, get that? I mean, I think that the background is so iconic and mm -hmm. so um, seen as itself? the 70s, yeah, the, yeah, the well, rays. The, yeah, well, where I kind of, I kind of that? that was kind of from the art I seen that came out of uh, China and Vietnam during that time. It was inspired, so I tried not to duplicate it, but, but was inspired by it and created my own mix of how, how to do the rays and what have you, and some of the art. Yeah. Vote for Survival, People's Free Food Program. Here's one, a uh, uh, vote for Shirley Chisholm and a vote for survival. Shirley Chisholm was a black woman who ran for president. Here we're clicking into the first woman to run for president. <laughs> Shirley Chisholm was the first woman to run for, uh, for president. And, she, and they tried to deny her the right, saying that she was taking votes away from, from everybody else. But we supported her. We held rallies for her. She came out here. And we held rallies for her over in the film open, one of those parks and what have you, when she came out here uh, during her campaign. She, oh, I think her slogan was unsold and unbought, something like that. Yeah. How would you compare the politics of Shirley Chisholm to say the politics of Barack Obama. Would you think, do you think that the Black Panther Party would have supported a Barack Obama? And if not, then why did you guys support Shirley Chisholm? Well, we, sure, we didn't think Shirley Chisholm was gonna transform the system, but we thought she was the better person at the time uh, from what we had communicating with her and what have you, when we knew history of her. Uh, knowing Barack Obama, we wouldn't have supported Barack Obama. Because <laughs> I can tell you the history of Barack Obama from the standpoint of Bobby Rush, who was the, who was the, assist, who was the deputy minister of defense in Chicago behind Fred Hampton when Fred Hampton was murdered. Uh, he, they was after to murder him, but he was protected from not being murdered. Uh, but when Bobby Rush became, ran for congressman of the state of Chicago, in Chicago, he, ran, he won. But when Obama ran the first time for congressman, they put him up to unseat Bobby Rush. 
the one who everybody in the community loved. And he lost that race. That's when he ran again and came the senator. So we know the history of Barack Obama. Now, now understanding, at the same time, we look at it in the context of here's a black man who is the puppet of the system that he serves, but at the same time, he's still confronted with the same racism that everybody, every, every other black person is confronted with. It, regardless of that, in that context, you look at it that context, but when you look at it from the context of, uh, he's a war criminal, just like the rest of them. He's doing their work. He, who, he, he also pushed more people out of the United States as immigrants than any other president. And he had, when you see this, uh, so I want to talk about it when I get to the other image. <laughs> he also get, was the one with drone warfare. He's the one who created drone warfare. Where you kill, where you got, you may talk talking about killing the terrorists, but you're killing seven, eight, nine, ten uh, innocent people. And then when you got people come in and help them, they kill more innocent people. And then you wonder why we got all these so-called terrorists in the world, these people that got families and murdered and slaughtered. Then you got the context of the Nobel Prize. Well, I'll talk about that later. So, <laughs> all power to the people. This is the survival programs that we had. What was the significance of children in your work? We see a lot of uh, people under the age of 10 in your work. Well, the children were a part. We had our own school. We had a uh, school, uh, and we had a lot of uh, a close association with the young people. We understood the young people were the ones who were, uh, were going to be the next leaders of, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of, of, of the next generation to move forward in relationship to the uh, challenges that we're confronted with as human beings. And so, and so they were an uh, integral part of the learning process. There's a film that was put out on the Oakland Community School, which is a very powerful film done in, in uh, 19, I believe 19, early 1970s, when Levert, uh, the guy who played in Roots, did a thing on alternative schools, and they did one on the Black Panther Party School, which is a very powerful documentary, which I can sh try to get to the library, you can see it, uh, where they interviewed the kids at the, the Black Panther Party, and they had the kids at the Black Panther Party interview in Huey Newton. And the young lady who interviewed Huey Newton was the young lady who went on to play Bernie Mac's wife in the Bernie Mac show. She Kalita. graduated from our school. Yeah, Kalita. Young. This is our sickle cell anemia. When we uh, uh, took up the, the struggle, of, when we found out that sickle cell anemia was a disease that predominantly impacted the African American community in this country, and that there was nothing being done about it, uh, we began to we began to get doctors and those to assist us, and we did over 100,000 free tests across the country on sickle cell anemia. Uh, we had a panther who was in the party from Dallas, Texas, who wrote a book. And he wrote about how ill he was all his life and never knew what it was. Doctors couldn't tell him, he didn't know what it was. And the doctors he, he, who he went to couldn't tell him what it was. Until he got into Panthers, he took the, he pricked him for the test for the blood for sickle cell anemia. And he found out that's why he was sick, because he had the sickle cell. To this day, there's no cure. There's maybe advances, but there's nothing uh, to prevent sickle cell anemia. When you say that the Black Panther Party opened up research in this country on sickle cell? I think we brought more uh, community awareness, you could say yes, in that context. There were these small organizations who were doing it, but they were hustling off of it. That's why we got into it and took it over, because they were, they were making money, but they weren't doing the, uh, sharing that with the community. It were poverty pimps, we call them. And so this is called Black Genocide, Sickle Cell Anemia showing the impact of it and the whole bit. So design elements as well as artistic was also created. And I couldn't have done this if I wouldn't have took up commercial art. As I took up fine art, maybe I'd have been a nice illustrator or painter, but doing production work and understanding pre-production work 
came from taking up commercial art because you have to understand you have to understand how uh, publications were put together. What was the process in that? The whole thing, and you had to deal with color and all and color separations, all those things, and and working in those small print shops that helped. What year was this? Because this is the first time in the, in this presentation that we've seen a different form. Yeah, this is about this is in the 1970s, early 1970s as well. Was this just a, a, a freak paper, or did you um, do a lot of reformatting like this, where you could see the blood cells and stuff like well, that? Well, uh, we had a, we had also a kiosk stand where I made display for uh, to raise funds for sickle cell anemia that was in different stores as, as well. But uh, we did a lot of, all these covers that you see are designed basically by on, uh, or have an element of design in them. It's not just this one, others as well. But for this one, you can say there's other, I think we may have did one other paper with the cover on sickle cell anemia, if I'm correct. But this is the most, uh, I think, impactful one we've done. This is also one dealing with the germ warfare declared against blacks. In 1939, you had about, I think it was 99 sharecroppers who couldn't read or write, uh, and they were given $50 to be in this, uh, this study, this syphilis study by the health department. Uh, and they uh, were in, this, in the study. In 1947, they had found a cure, and it was penicillin for syphilis. But they didn't give them the penicillin. They kept them in the test until 1972. In 1972 was when you had these progressive reporters who were able to get this information that they could not get published in the mainstream papers. So they began to give it to the Black Panther Party and our alternative press. And when we alternative press and Black Panther Party began to put it in the papers, that's when the study stopped, 1972, because it was being exposed. Now, all that time, they didn't pass, they didn't have healthy health problems, going blind, going sick, transferring to the family, loved ones, all that is going on. At the time, were there other uh, newspapers in the black community or other communities that were as progressive as the Black Panther newspaper? Well, no, because we weren't, we weren't, we weren't shackled by advertising. Ours was not, we didn't take advertising. The only appetite we ever had was when this brother named Jonelle, who was a store owner, who donated to us. And we said we, do, we have supported him by giving him an ad in our paper. But we didn't take advertising. And, and uh, because you have to understand, black press is kind of a mainstream kind of alternative to the press. And for them to survive, because it's about uh, making a, a, a living, then they have to force the advertisers to advertise with them. And so, therefore, that gives the advertisers some kind of uh, leverage over them in regards to some of the things that they may want to put in their paper. And, but you had, of course, here in the area, Dr. Carl Goodlett, which in front of the uh, city hall is named after him, which that's what I worked for, the Black Press, after I left the Panthers, didn't have that kind of situation. Uh, as uh, Maybe limited, but not that kind of situation. Because he was pretty progressive. Dr. Nim used to support us. When we worked, bought our first uh, typesetting equipment, we bought it from the Sun Reporter newspaper back then because they were up. When the police were going to attack us in the office that we had, our central distribution office, where Yoshi's is, that used to be an uh, office, there used to be a Black Panther uh, distribution office there. That was our national distribution office when it was just feeling a little different then. And Dr. Goodlett and Mr. Flemings and them came and stood in front of the door because it was a death thing that happened at that time because it was pretty intense. And they stood in front of, because we tried to go out the back and they had police out the back and they had the whole round. And so it was gonna go down, but it was Dr. Goodluck and them who came and maybe solved that problem for that day and that moment and that time. So in that context, uh, they were our allies. They should write stuff in the paper about the, uh, the Panthers and what was going on. So, but, you know, he had another perspective. He was considered the radical aspect of the black press. This is SAFE, Seniors Against a Fearful Environment. We had a senior program where we take seniors, pick them up from their houses, 
uh, from the satellite homes, uh, take them shopping, take them to uh, cash their checks. Uh, they had at our school, uh, they, we used to do things in, in the context of uh, where they would come in and they would produce programs or whatever. I have a whole, there's a whole fro uh, photographic program I have on that that shows that, that can, uh, about these social programs that I'm talking about. Uh, this illustration here was about the fact that you had the Oakland, California talking about spending $54,000 on a helicopter which I mentioned that of saying, why should Oakland spend $54,000 on a helicopter when we need funds for seniors against a fearful environment? And what we're saying then is that if they really want to stop crime, they don't buy $54,000 a helicopter. They take that $54,000 and, and invest it in the young people to support the seniors to cash their checks, to, take, to support the seniors to go do their groceries. Then you're talking about cutting into crime because you, you investing in the young people. But you're not doing it if, you other, if you're just talking about a helicopter to make money for the prison industrial complex. And SAFE was our acronym. And then you had the San Francisco Police Department who started a senior program day after. That's who, a lot of people don't know that's what it, they got into it after we got into it. And they sent us a letter saying that they had the same acronyms as we did and that we could no longer use it. <laughs> and we just, we just tore it up and kept on going. <laughs> What's the importance of, you have people in such natural poses, like you have people walking right there at the bottom. I mean, you don't get, you don't draw people who seem to be posing, you, you draw them in, in action. Why? Well, I guess it comes natural. I, I'm, I, I really didn't give a lot of thought. Sometimes I have action, sometimes I have not action, but you know, it's, I guess it's an expression in the context of the art itself to give it more uh, depth, meaning, and more feeling to it. Yeah. But that, you see the portrait, but the illustration, those are, that's art. Those are photographs in the front. That's, you know, cut out, overlapped into the artwork itself. This is uh, uh, today's news. As we see, you got high rises going up, but as you got high rises going up, you got blocks and blocks and homeless at the same time. Hypertension kills. I'm hungry, I'm unemployed, I'm black. As you can see in these expression, it was a line drawing, but it's the feeling of the lines. It's the lines in the artwork that give you the feeling of what is being said. So you, sometimes you have to feel it. You have to become a part of that. You have to feel it, what it is that you're saying. Why do you think that the government and the press militarized the, the images and the, the image of the Black Panther Party? And I mean, we're seeing so much that wasn't around guns. If you look at television or you listen to the history books, you will hear that um, the Black Panther Party was about guns and this person got shot and that person got shot. But can you talk a little bit about how that was used to cover up this? Well, it was used because of the fact when you cover up this, you're talking about the, uh, a, a mass movement in relation, and you talk to a broad section of people who can understand it, this is about transforming and changing society. Uh, so this goes one beyond just defending ourselves, but educating, enlightening people about defending themselves was the thing to do because it was a constitutional right, the second amendment of the constitution gave that right, but at the same time, we knew that it was necessary to educate the people about the quality of life that they wanted. And so therefore, that's why we began to focus on these uh, community survival programs. Because the government wasn't feeding hungry children. And that's why they call, and that's why when we began to expose it, it became public enemy number one. The free breakfast for school kids came public enemy number one. Because we were, we were exposing what could be done, what the government wasn't doing. When you say public enemy number one, I know what you're talking about, but I don't know if everyone in the crowd knows that J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI at the time, made the Black Panther Party the number one threat to national security in the country. Why is that? 
because the fact that we were self, we believed in self-determination because we were, well, because we could, great, we had great communicators who could communicate and we implemented and practiced what we shared and we pointed out the contradictions what the government should have been doing and wasn't doing. That's the bottom line, is that we were uncovering, exposing the realities of what didn't exist in this country, what had been mis, and, and, and exposed, the misinformation campaign, uh, what this government had always spoon fed the American people to believe. Here's one, uh, I had this book, House of Bondage, dealing with South Africa. And uh, at the time, that was the only book I had. I, and so I used to look through it a lot. And when I came to do this image call, I call it, it's like a, 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 a spark that lights the purifier, but where I took the photographs from the book and put them on the books of matches. And as the, you look at each one, the matches come out, then the matches become a simmer, a sizzle. Then they begin to burn a little bit more. Then they become this flame. And then this, out of this flame, you have this freedom fighter. And out of, at the bottom it says, repression breeds resistance. So it's the conditions and the situation that creates resistance. If there was no repression, there may not be no resistance. But no exploitation, we, would, we could do other things in life. Here's an amazing poster of my work done by the Cuban artists in uh, 1967, 68. Amazing poster. You had the, uh, the uh, artists from the, who used to go work in the brigades, used to work in the sugar canes, help the Cubans with the, when the season came, the crop, sugar with the sugar cane. And they would see these art over there. And they would come back and say, someone would say, we seen this art. You didn't do this. The Cubans did this. But the Cubans were, looking and inspired by the work that I did at that time. And for many years, that was the case until it was a guy, Lincoln Cushion, who put out a book, who also thought that when he went to Cuba to look at some of the work and he realized that my name was on the original work there, then he began to also realize that it, it was uh, the work that I, they were copying was some of the work that I had did, which was fine back then because it was in solidarity. It was not about exploitation or what have you. And I'm gonna show you the two images uh, next of where the art came from. Can you speak on some of the other countries that um, also had your work highlighted? Well, well I also, so, uh, we could say movements and stuff like that. Movements in, at in, the in, time. Yeah, in, in, in the UK, in, in the UK, uh, also in, the, um, uh, both in the UK, some of the, some of the African liberation movements, yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of the, the student movements and, and also the movements in uh, South America, Latin America. Mm -hmm. So that's, the, that, as you can see, that's the two images. put together. Here, and this next image is also in uh, one that they also remixed. It was in how, you, how we knew they were reading the interior of the paper, the, the paper, because this was a, maybe a two by four, small black and white image in the paper itself. Then they remixed it in four colors, solidarity with the African American people, August 18, 1968, in four different languages. Here's that original image there, where, where it is. They just flipped, they just, uh, flipped it around and remix it. Afro-American solidarity with the oppressed people of the world. I, Gerald Ford, am the 38th puppet of the United States. <laughs> Corporations, we knew that back then. We, I mean, when you had the collapse and the Wall Street, all this stuff going on, uh, corporations coming in, you hear people giving advice that you ain't never heard before. Can you speak to how this picture relates to the Panthers' doctrine of intercommunalism? What did intercommunalism mean, particularly as it is expressed well, in this well, picture? Well, intercommunalism means that uh, the whole world, all act, everybody around the world is being expressed, express, uh, oppressed and exploited by the same corporations. That's what that represents. And it represents that uh, perhaps their leadership as well is the puppets of the United States. It inspires thought, a thought process around the issue of who controls the local governments in the world. And as we know, when you're talking about the Trans-Pacific Partnership and all that, that's what you're talking about, government control, world government control. 
Well, you got local governments that ain't got no rights because they have to sign on the dotted line in the agreement with the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And if the, if, the, if the masses of the people locally or otherwise don't go, grow with that or go along with that, the, the local politician can't do nothing about it anyway because they'd already said, agreed, and they can be sued. So you have, that's, and that exists today. It might even exist in relationship to what we have with this, all this high rises and stuff going up and no homes for the poorest, poor, poor people and people being pushed out. Because what can local, maybe they didn't sign on the dotted line for that and made those agreements, for all we know. So would you say that Huey was the first political theorist to talk about the new world order or one world order? Well, I, I may be in the context of being inspiring to a group of people who didn't know, yes. But I think it's been an ongoing process for, 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 for eons. <laughs> this was uh, Halloween. And it says, trick or treat, pig, trick or treat. <laughs> And that, to your left, that was Richard Nixon, the president, and Spiro Agnew, who was the vice president. Both were criminals running the government. Disgrace. Both had to leave office in disgrace. The president and the vice president had to leave office in disgrace. Would you equate how the country looked at Richard Nixon with how the country looks at Trump today? Uh, yeah, same way. <laughs> <laughs> The conspiracy to destroy the Black Panther Party, that's my COINTEL Pro when we did articles on the COINTEL Pro, counterintelligence program, which we mentioned earlier. Can you speak to how COINTEL Pro, most of the operations um, during a certain period were aimed at the Black Panther Party? I mean, like 249 versus like 300. Do you know the exact figure? And can you speak specifically to how much of COINTEL Pro was aimed at the Black Panther Party? Say it again, that last part. Uh, see, can you speak to how much of Cointel Pro was aimed at the Black Panther Party? I know that there's that there's an exact figure of how many operations there were in Cointel Pro. Period, and a large majority of them were aimed at the Black Panther Party. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I can't speak to the number. I know there was around 230 uh, some operations uh, were aimed at the Black Panther Party, and they were meant to destroy and discredit the party by any means necessary. Even like when I mentioned in that video earlier when the brother came to the office with that letter on four stationery, a good friend of Bobby's who was a donator, businessman who donated to the community programs, and how he was shaking and scared because he seen this letter and he thought it was so real and thought it was the Panthers, threatening him, asking him for more money. And Bobby's explaining to him, that's not us, that's the police, but he could not even believe it. They're talking to Bobby, and he, and he just couldn't believe it. And so it was the psychological impact of what went on in the, that context. Uh, the same thing, uh, sending criminal elements into the stores to stick up the stores, dress like Panthers, and they thinking it's Panthers doing it. All those things, they and pitting Panthers against each other, infiltrating the party with agents and provocateurs, misinformation, all those dynamics, and, exploit, and, and exploiting the limitations of us as young people as well. And can you speak to how COINTELPRO is still playing out today, say in the San Francisco 8 case that we had recently in this city, but also with people like Imam Jamil al and Mumia and Veronza mm -hmm. Bowers? Oh yeah, it, well it continues. You may not call it COINTELPRO, but it, it's, still, it's still the same thing. And they legalize it now, so that they can't be claimed to be brought up in, in court in many ways. So they, a lot of the stuff that they do now is legal. That's, and they had these think tanks and stuff where they got together and decided to legalize stuff or even when, as the process goes along and people become exposed to stuff and begin to respond and react, then they begin to legalize things as well as you, as you, as you go along, and particularly uh, criminalizing movements like Black Lives Movement and other movements out there and threatening them with all these 10, 20 years for protesting. The psychological impact of all that is part of COINTELPRO. This one says, I wonder, oh, I'm scared. This one says, I wonder if Nixon, if Nixon is bugging us now. <laughs> this one says, I wonder if, if, if Trump is spying on us now. <laughs> 
This one is called King Nixon. Corporate profit going up, consumer spending going down. <laughs> Corporate profit going up, consumer spending going down 50 years later. <laughs> Class Brothers. Um, we are soldiers in the army. We have to fight although we have to die. We have to hold up the blood-stained banner. We got to hold it up until we die. My, my mother, she was a soldier. She had in her hand a freedom plow. When she got old and couldn't fight anymore, she said, we're going to get up and fight anyhow. My father, he was a soldier. He had in his hand a freedom plow. When he got old and couldn't fight anymore, he said, we're going to get up and fight anyhow. Now, we, all our soldiers, we have in our hand a freedom plow. When we get old and can't fight anymore, we got to get up and fight anyhow. What, um, what role do you think that the Black Panther played in the Black is Beautiful cultural movement? And can you speak to the importance of culture politically? I know that Mao Zedong's cultural revolution uh, inspired the Black Panther Party. So can well, you well uh, I'm, I'm not saying, it, Mao Zedong didn't expire Black Panther Party. It was the fact that we used to read the Red Book because of universal principles. And they started reading the Red Book because we used, you and them used to see us sell the Red Book to the students at the University of California because they, they used to like to read that. And so they used to write it, sell that book to raise money for the technical equipment that we had for the, uh, in the Black Panther Party in the early days. So in that context, the book was there and the principles were universal principles that you could apply anywhere in the world. Uh, because they, uh, I'm quite sure the, the Red Book itself was written out of those struggles that took place during, the, during that period and what have you. But they were universal principles. So if you looked at them from a universal context, then there were things in there that you, like each one teach one. You know, how do you apply that to, you know, all those things. And so that's those kinds of ways we were able to use the context of the Red Book in the po political education classes of the Black Panther Party. But more so, I was asking, like, in reference to the black is beautiful, you guys put a lot of confidence in black people. Oh, yeah, yeah. How black, what well, was the style, art, and the style, you could say that the style, the dress, the talk is a part of the art. The act, the act itself is revolution, is an artistic act in the way that it presents itself visually. So you could say the style of the hair, the talk, the language, all that is an art form. That, I, that people identify with and uh, gravitate to. Who wrote the poem? Uh, that was an uh, old spiritual song that uh, changed the words to a little bit, yeah. But I think it might have been one of the songs that they were talking about on the Underground Railroad when he was trying to plot to make an escape to somewhere or a meeting because they had that in the spirituals. You know, the spirit, they were just spirituals. They were songs that were given messages and at a time that something, action was going to take place. And the Panthers also were famous for changing the words of pop songs at the time, right? Can you speak to some of those? Oh yeah, well we had the uh, Lumpin, the singer group, the Lumpin, who were like, uh, like the, those who were uh, uh, just wasn't looking for no job, didn't want no job. That's considered like the lumping outside of society, rebellious whole bit. And so, yes, that was, uh, they used to sing uh, 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 songs that were very re relevant, uh, songs by well-known artists, and they would uh, add uh, revolutionary content to those songs. But I can't remember what it is now. <laughs> Did I do this one? Which one is that? Okay. Caution, surviving is criminal. Event of two black men's lives. Here again, prison camps, USA, the unknown slaves. You call it the prison industrial complex today, and we know what that's about. That's about privatization. That's about making money and profit, which is, it was then more so now. And when you talk about making profit, you talk about you have to have a product. Just like if you have a store, you have to have food on your shelves in order to make a profit because you have to have something to sell or what have you. But same thing, if you any private prisons, you got to have a product to make money. The inmates become the product. If you ain't got enough inmates on your shelf to make a product, then you ain't gonna make no money. 
because it's about making money. So that means that there are always going to be people who are going to be incarcerated in these, in these prisons, and, and, and particularly in these private prisons, because it's about profit. It's about making money. Here again is looking at one, why must black people look at each other through prison bars? Where is thy freedom? Yeah, he may be in maximum security, and the family is linked to him by being in minimum security. What's that on his head? Uh, that's showing that he's been brutalized. That's a bandage. Here again is one I did, I, and it looked like this images. Both of these images came from the same person. But this is when I used to look at books, and I filed them away. And uh, after looking at them all the time, and I could uh, recall. And so, but these, this came from two different images, just two different individuals, young people. But when I had to feel for what I wanted to do with this here, it came to me that I remember that one, and I remember how it looked. And I was able to go to it and integrate that into the artwork. And uh, then to just and to create the whole sense of, it says, my suffering, my bitterness, my loneliness. I'm not going to get it, let it get me down. I'm not going to let it turn me around. Uh, then I had begun to get a feeling of how the words that I wanted to use and how to frame the words I want to use with the image to give more depth and meaning to the image. There were times earlier on that I used to paraphrase, but after a while I began to just get the feeling of what I wanted to say and how I wanted to express it with the images themselves. This is a picture of George Jackson, who was brother who went to jail as a common criminal and was informed and enlightened and educated in prison. And when Huey Newton had got shot and they sent him to prison, he put, got the word to Huey that uh, he wanted to start the chapter of the Black Panther Party. And that's the first chapter was started in the San Quentin prison. Can you speak to George Jackson's importance? In, um, well, his importance is uh, as, a, as a, a theorist, a revolutionary theorist, a writer, who was introduced to us by Angela Davis, who helped connected with him who wrote his first book, uh, his first book, uh, Love Letters, I believe it was. And so that was the connection to him and to the respect that he has in, uh, around the world. Uh, I remember being in Portugal for an exhibition. And a part panther I was went, went to look for stuff as a collector. And he found George Jackson's book written in Portuguese that he found at one of the uh, 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 flea markets there. Yeah. Can you also speak to, you was uh, locked up with one of his comrades as a young person, and can you speak to the relationship that his formation in the Black Panther Party had, um, you know, speaking of Hugo Pinnell particularly, but can you speak to the relationship you had as children as well as the relationship? You know, you know um, can you speak to the relationship that you and one of the San Quentin Six, Hugo Pinnell, mm -hmm. um, who was, who was, um, indicted after the murder of George Jackson. Can you speak to the, the relationship that you had individually with Hugo, but also the oh, Panthers yeah. had with the prison movement? Oh yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, we used, we, our, our connection to the prison, I'll take that first, was that we used to take people to visit those who were incarcerated. We had a free bus into prison program that we took. We used to, they used to send us a listing of the commissary and the needs that they needed, like candy, toothpaste, and all those things. And we would get all that stuff donated, and we would send it in to the prisoners. We had a list of people who visit certain prisons every week. And these were not just local, but this is national programs. Yeah. And Hugo Pinnell, well, me and Hugo raised up in the field more together. We used to shoot pool, let's like pool hall, hang out together. We was in juvenile together. <laughs> And uh, so he was a good brother. He was a good person. And uh, he took the rap for his family, his, one of his cousins. He did not do what was done. He just wouldn't rat out his, his family. So that's how he went to, went, went to prison for life. Yeah. And was assassinated. Mm -hmm. And was assassinated. Yeah, was assassinated. And he was assassinated because they had had many run-ins and battles in, in the, inside the prisons with the extremists uh, in, in the prisons. And so they set him up. Uh, they put him on the yard without letting his uh, lawyers know that they were going to do this after he had been in the hole for all these many years. 
and they sent him out on the yard. As soon as they sent him out on the yard, they killed him, assassinated him. And we know it was the authorities that did it, you know. Two years ago. Yes. Fred Hampton, uh, the image of Fred Hampton, who was leader of the uh, Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party. The image in the back was Mark Clark, who was the uh, leader of the Southern Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party. There's a film called The Murder of Fred Hampton, where you can see the history of this on YouTube, who Fred was um, drugged and murdered in his sleep by an Asian provocateur who infiltrated the party, who stole a car. He had took it across state lines. They told him that if he infiltrated the party, they would make a deal with him. They did. He worked his way all up into security. He was the one to set up the house and told, told him that all these guns that weren't in the house were there. And I believe he was the one who drugged Fred. And so that night, the police came, shot through the house at bed level, murdered Fred. Other comrade Panthers in the house were shot. A sister was wounded in the knee. A colored sister was beaten. And Fred Hampton Jr. was in the wound of one of, the, of, the young, of his, his girlfriend then. They went back into the room. And they asked, they said he's still breathing. They shot, pow, pow, she heard, shot, pow, pow. They shot him again, came out, say, now he's good and dead. And they came out smiling. But with the lawyers and the uh, help of the lawyers, they were able to preserve the site. And you had people from the community stand up in the winter who waited in line for two or three blocks to go into this house to see what had took place. Can you talk to, about his age and what was the significance of what he had organized? Well, his age, he was, Fred Hampton was 21 years of age. Uh, early on, like Mamiya Abu Jamal, he was a member of the NAACP as a young person, but then he joined the Black Panther Party. His, uh, his, uh, the significance of Fred Hampton, he was a great communicator, but not only that, COINTERPRO came into the mix real heavy in the context of when we begin to organize in those sprawling housing projects with the agreement of the most notorious gangs in the country during that, that time, the Peace Stone Rangers. And they begin to become inspired by what they've seen us doing, and they begin to do some of the same kind of programs. And it was thereafter that they began, the police began to send them letters saying, watch out for the Panthers, they're out to kill you, and these kinds of things. So it was the context of beginning to change the mindset of the gangbangers to do something constructive, which the police and the government don't want that. It's always about divide and conquer. Keep the chaos going. Those kind of contexts. And so that was, that was the, uh, the impact of the, of the, and Chicago had a whole different style of language, way of communicating to. I, it, I mean, it was amazing. I went there four or five times, but they had a whole different, language, the way they communicated in, in, in Chicago. You talking about their slang? Or what? Yeah, the slang, yeah, yeah. Here's a Carl, this is a, a wash drawing that I did. This is Carl Hampton, no kin to Fred Hampton. He was the chairman of the uh, Houston chapter of the Black Panther Party. Um, in, uh, in that chapter, um, he, he, this brother was 21 years old, wanted to start a chapter. At the time, we had shut down for a moment. So what happened is that um, he started called Par People's Party Two, like Black Panther Party Two, but People's Party Two. But then when we opened it up, uh, he started, part and they cleaned up the streets. There was no substance abuse, no drugs in the neighborhood, no, no nothing. Seniors could go out and walk, all that. Uh, got into a, a con confrontation with the Houston police. They left, they came back, a couple of weeks later, they believe it was somebody there who set him up because they told him that the police were out in the streets and he went out to see what was going on. And they had allowed the police to go up into a church tower, a police sniper, go up into a church tower. And when he went out into the middle of the street, they assassinated him. So each year they have a commemoration in honoring him. Uh, that church had to close down the whole, in, in regards to that. But this is showing you what kinds of situations the Panthers was in. At, during that same time, in New Orleans, you had the police come dressed up as nuns and priests and knocked and came to the door and the sister went to the door, I think she asked who it was, 
They shot her through the chest. She survived. So those were the kind of things that we were dealing with uh, during that uh, period in, in time as well. I just see it as a tie-in. Can you talk about Executive Mandate 1 and why Huey mandated it? Well, Executive Mandate 1 is about the, we call it Prison Camps USA. Uh, we were talking about the prison concentration camps, what you call today the prison industrial complex, how it's going to be used to incorporate, include, uh, to, uh, to incarcerate uh, people of black and brown, people of color. Well, maybe I'm talking about two, the one with the search warrant. Was oh, it? yeah, that was Executive Mandate number three, I think. That was when uh, I remember I was at Elders Cleaver's house, Kathleen Cleaver in San Francisco, as we had been politicking, came in late that night. Uh, the police came to the door at Elger's apartment, and they knocked on the door, and Elger asked who it was. They said, it's the San Francisco police. He said, do you have a search warrant? He said, a search warrant's okay. We had no problem. They could come in. They had nothing to hide. But they said, no, we don't have one. He said, well, you have to kick the fucking door in. And they began to kick the door in. And when they come to kick the door in, they started looking for guns. I don't have that illustration, but I did an illustration, unfortunately. And, and, they, and they couldn't find no guns. So, and what happened was that earlier that day, because there had been threats on Elders and Kathleen's life, that day or a couple of days before, they had consulted with a lawyer to see all right if it was to have her have a gun in her house for their protection. And it was okay for her to have the gun registered in her name, but he couldn't have it in his name because the fact that he was on parole. And if, if, they, if he's on parole and had a gun in his in possession, then he could have been violated and sent back to prison, which was that raid was basically about. So what happened, they were probably looking for unregistered guns, illegal guns, in the house so that they could justify the, 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 the raid in relationship to sending Elders Cleaver back to prison. But what happened is, about a week, two, three weeks later, they went to Bobby Seale's house in Berkeley and did the same thing. Then it was there after that, we wrote that executive mandate number three. In essence, it was saying that if the police come to a house, they have a search warrant, we have no problem. We let them in. Ain't got no problem about that. But we weren't going to let them kick in our doors anymore. So we said that uh, it took, we took an essence from the 1940s when the Al Capone gang dressed up like police, some of them did. Valentine's Day Massacre. Yeah, Valentine's Day Massacre, and they went across town, and they slaughtered the other gang because they put their hands up thinking it was the police, and they slaughtered them. Well, we say, and we use that example to say, we're no longer would we allow the police to come in our house and kick in our doors, because we don't know if you're police or gangsters. And so it was thereafter that you begin to have all these shootouts across the country. Because what happened, they began to also use that to exploit it with infiltrating the party with agent provocateurs to create these shootouts across the country. And so, and it's documents of that as well. You see, so in that, in, in, in that essence, it escalated the situation where there was these confrontations and shootouts. And, and according to Bobby Sale and a few others, Kathleen Cleaver, I think they say about 28 uh, uh, Panthers or more were killed and about 10 or 12 police were killed and wounded in these shootouts that took place across the country during that period. I mean, it was a tense period. This one also talks about uh, political prisoners during that period, uh, the 60s. Bobby Seale and Huey Newton were one of the uh, uh, political prisoners at that time. This actual is a photograph I cut out from another actual photograph that was taken, and I remixed it into this image here. This one is free, the New York 21, and all political prisoners. Afeni Shakur, Tupac's mother, was a member of the New York chapter of the Black Panther Party. Um, they were charged with over 100 and something charges. Uh, and um, he went to court. Within two hours of going to court, all charges were dismissed. Kind of tells you something. I mean, all kinds of blowing up stuff, to all kinds of stuff that they had fabricated. And within two hours or two and a half hours of the of jury here, all charges were dismissed. Here's one of Angela Davis, who was a comrade of ours, showing our solidarity when she was incarcer on the run and incarcerated. 
Here's one in Bobby Sale called Kidnap, uh, where La Pena Culture Center is across the street in Oakland, I mean Berkeley, right across the street, used to be one of our central headquarters. And one day I went by there, we were uh, coming in to do the work on the paper. Uh, we could tell there was something going on out the street, but we didn't know what it was. Um, we left that evening, went to the filling station on the corner of Ashby and Shattuck. Uh, when we got there and went out, got in the car, we was in two cars. We had the, we had the federal marshals vamped down on us with machine guns. They snatched the Bobby Seal out of his car he was in, and they drove away, and we were got in touch with our lawyers, and we found out that they had took him to the federal building in San Francisco, and that they were sending him back to Chicago, because this was 1968. He had been invited to speak at the uh, activist rally protest against the war in Vietnam that took place outside uh, of the Democratic Convention. And they were saying he incited to riot, which was not the case, but there was a setup to get Bobby. And so he was uh, uh, kidnapped. And so that's why I call this one kidnapped. Hmm? Oh, you say we're running out of time? Well, I just wanted to open it up a little bit to any type of questions. Oh, okay. Or feedback or anything anyone in the audience wanted to share? Anyone? Microphone right here so we can get it on tape. And, 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 can, can, just approach the mic, please. And also to continue on with the slides as well? As, uh, yeah, okay. sure. Okay. Oh, yeah, so should I wait until the end of the slide? No, no, it's fine. No, yeah, it's good. Okay. Cool. So um, first of all, thank you for your education, your activism. Um, it means a lot to me personally. I'm an international activist. Uh, I'm originally from Arizona. I'm Mexican-American, and my mom immigrated to this country illegally. Uh, Arizona has its own host of problems and fights and struggles for um, Latin American immigrants or immigrants of any kind. But um, so, like I said, I'm an international activist, and I've been doing anti-capitalist art. Do you have a question? Yeah, I do. I've been doing anti-capitalist art, and I was wondering if you had any particular advice about moving forward now that I'm here in San Francisco. I actually just got here a few weeks ago. Well, I didn't hear that. I was, that last part. Ask it again. Oh, do you have any advice for someone who's working actively on anti-capitalist art? Yeah, to be informed, uh, basically informed of, of the matter that you, you're doing, because uh, you will be, you more likely to be confronted about the issues. So you have to be able to express your perspective and point of view on those issues, to enlighten and to form and to educate those who may not be or may be caught up in the context of what's being uh, you're being attacked by. So it's always to be informed and enlightened. Okay. And. Uh, I understand that it's going to be hard work, and it's <laughs> have fun, but it's going to be a job. Okay. Yeah, of course. So you only, it's the only thing that seems to make sense. Mm -hmm. So thank you. If you have a question, just line up, and then we'll have them just continue. Actually, I don't have a question, but I have an announcement to make. I'm with the San Francisco Peace and Freedom Party. The party is celebrating our 50th anniversary. Uh, we achieved ballot status in 1967 and actually ran a number of Panthers as candidates in the early 60s. Uh, anyway, on Friday, uh, October 27th, 7 p.m. at the Eric Casada Center, we are having a celebration of our 50th anniversary. The program will include Cindy Sheehan, James uh, Van, Gloria Lariva, Dave Welch, Marcia Feinland, and Francisco Herrera. And I have <coughs> cards which I can hand out to people. <coughs> Yeah, if you can leave those cards over in the sure. back where the One City, One Book books are, people can grab them. Thank you. Um, what do you think is, or uh, do you see, or the black community is very different. Can you hear me? Okay. Speaking to the mic. All right. So the, the black community is very different today than it was back then. Can you speak to some of those differences? Because, I mean, today it seems to be a, a large disconnect. I mean, you know, I think black people, we should be, they should be having their children here, come in here like they would come to church. You know, so speak to some of those differences of the black community in 1969 and 2017. Are you asking, are you saying that it was more politicized then? Or, or, or um, how more much? More together, more unified? Is or how much different was it? You know, you know where we're. Oh where, yeah, where, yeah. Where, well, where, I mean, you could you could say that uh, because you had the Black Panther Party, that young people were gravitated to because it was a youthful organization, 
and the, and the climate in the, in the country at the time was young blacks being murdered, being justified, the whole bit as it is today. But you had the Black Panther Party, which inspired a lot of young people to want to do, make change and want to do something. And because of that, you had a vehicle for which young black people could get involved in. And it became a vehicle where some people disagreed with and agreed with. And those who disagreed also started organizations and movements as well. So by the nature of who we was, it began to expand in many dynamics in many ways with many different organizations and what have you. So today, and what you have too, is you have from since then, you have to understand that they dismantled all the social programs in the 70s. You, then you had the infiltration, uh, government infiltrating the uh, crack cocaine into the neighbor, in the community. Then you had babies raising babies. Then uh, many decades of that. Then on top of that, you had young blacks who then, back then, we only seen uh, 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 what, uh, uh, a, a black program maybe once every two weeks a, a week, but then you, you know, these young people grew up on BET, MTV, they, uh, they uh, in freight trailer with the, 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 uh, the, the, the hip hop, negative hip hop, until you had Dead Prez and all them come on the scene and Public Enemy to begin to transform that. But you, so you had all those dynamics that's going on all them, uh, over the many years. And then, you, and then it's the repression that breeds resistance. And what you see now is maybe the possibility to spark of something becoming, uh, because you got a young, young people who are interested. It ain't gonna never be absolute, it's an ongoing process. But you got young people who are interested in trying to do things, who are taking note of how things were done and being inspired by it, you know, but it's still an ongoing process. The whole dynamics is different today than it was, the repression is a whole uh, uh, different animal. Yeah, different animal. Yes. Oh, I got one more, one more question. Important too. Um, I heard, I even heard you mention it too. But I heard Geronimo Pratt one time on an interview say there were many different other organizations besides the Black Panthers, and the media just kind of called everything Black Panthers back then. Yeah. Well, well, because of that, because you had a lot of these other organizations who were allies, and some of them overlapped and some of them came from the Black Panther Party. But it was also because the Black Panther Party had a machinery and was, was the one who was, in, you could say, vanguard lead by example. Some of the things that you hear, some of the other organizations that might have said that the Black Panther Party was revisionist for feeding, having free programs. But we knew that that was the way of enlightening and educating the community, because this was the desires and the needs of the community. But now you have some of them same organizations talking about they wish they had to have them. And we need them today, you see. So you enlighten people by having vision. And what you do may not be something that people want to do right then, all activists, because some of them are ready to go to battle and not understanding that it's the process of the work that has to be done. That's a part of the process as well. You know, feeding the hungry children, getting up, educating, enlightening, developing structure as you do that. Improving your infrastructure as you do that. Being able to talk about the situation and things that make up organizations today can come from what we were doing overall. You know, we had internal problems. So if we talk about that, you can understand how you have to develop structure. You know, we had brothers using the B word who came out the street. And so we had to deal with that issue in the context of making sure that that, didn't, that wasn't allowed. Them. And how we did that is we had them had to work with sisters that they didn't want to work with and take orders from them sisters. Interesting. You see what I'm saying? So when you had, you had to grow. We had to have, we had things in the relationship to housing and all those things that we had to, you had to do. Collective responsibility. How, how, and we had to make sure that the houses are clean, but we had to make a response. It was not just a responsibility of just the women. The men had to take care of the responsibilities. They had security. You had people who had to take care of the kids. Men and women had to take care of the kids. You see, all these dynamics come out of the experience itself that we can share with a lot of perhaps today, structurally, that people can begin to implement in the context of today. And there's a whole lot of them, you know, that we old obstacle had to overcome. You know, when, when you have interactions, you have babies you know, in the party, and you have to have childcare, 
for the babies. We seen that that was a thing that the, sis the, one, the sisters had to want to love and take care of the babies, so it eliminated the work. So we started child care centers. You see, and so that became the responsibility of everyone. And so not only then, then what Bobby Seale had seen in the community, the sister who had a child care center, but it wasn't being done at that time. And he said, if we were to do that, we could enlighten a whole lot of people about child care. And that's when we began to implement these child care centers and talk about it. And sure enough, it came something that people became inspired by, whether they agreed or disagreed with us. Child care centers began, became a part of the process of what people needed, knew they needed and wanted to do. Wow. Uh, uh, Cecil Williams, when he first came to Oakland, when he first came to California, first place he came was the Black Panther Party. A lot of people don't know that. He came trip straight to the Black Panther Party. We used to go and talk to him at his house. Then he set up them program. Yeah. A millionaire too. <laughs> yeah. Can you speak a little bit to the relationship that the Black Panther Party had to female leadership? I know that on Leave it to Beaver, on television, um, the, the mother was still sitting in the back seat while Kathleen Cleaver and Erica Huggins sat on the Central Committee. So can you speak to how progressive the uh, <laughs> Black Panther Party was yeah, in was. relationship yeah, it, to American yeah. society? Yeah. Well, you had uh, Black Panther women who started chapters and branches of the Black Panther Party. I blame New Haven and back east were part of those who were included in the lead still up of chapters. But you had those sisters who were first group of sisters in the party, which were really from the hood, hardcore, and they used to say, hey, what's part of our leadership? We can give them our life just like everybody else. So they used to demand that. So that, you know, that also played into the fact that the fact that women were sacrificed just like men and making contributions, so equal opportunity. We were first ones that came out in support of gays in the party. He had a guy who was a gay, across the direction named Roderick, who used to work with the party on the, on the rallies and what have you. And he said he wanted to be a party member. And he would say, well, this is democratic, democratic so he can be a party member. And wrote a position paper on, on, in, in relationship to uh, our, our solidarity as well. Even though there was, that don't mean that there wasn't chauvinism in the party. It ain't like we become puritanical. You still had to deal with those issues, but we had in, in position, we had to put that in, in the context. Thank you very much. I'm quite impressed that you're a repository of a great deal of history. Appreciate your speaking. I was looking and remembering that you said SAFE, the acronym was for seniors. Yes. Are you aware of what that current acronym now is in San Francisco? I'm wondering, is it the same safety awareness for everyone, which is now okay. um, crime prevention program in San Francisco? Is that the same acronym? Well, if it's the one that the police department claimed they had and they wanted us to stop using ours. And well, it's, it's. Yeah, well, it's, we, back, well, see, we had it initially, but that was then. Black Panther Party as an organization doesn't exist anymore, but then we had it, yes. It, we, we started in San Francisco's police department from its website, it said that in 1978, and then developed into its own nonprofit. Yeah, yeah, but we had it back in the early 70s. I'm, that's why they sent us a letter claiming that we couldn't use it anymore. And we said, we just tore the letter up. So I know we're closing out the program. I was hoping that you could uh, share a little bit more of your contemporary work. Yes, it's almost there. About okay, five, great. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'll do that right now. I'll, I'll just glance through these that are, and let you see these, and then I'll talk about the more relevant stuff in a minute. That was when Bobby Seale was in prison in, and went to trial in Chicago. And what they did is they, he went to court, and lawyer Charles Gary had to have a minor operation, so he wanted to represent himself in the court, uh, and they refused to allow him to do that. So uh, I didn't want to do a court, there was a lot of amazing court illustrators, so I wanted to interpret what it represented. When they, in court, they chained him and gagged him every time he spoke out against the, in the proceedings, they mentioned his name, he therefore uh, was gagged and chained in the courtroom. Never in history had that ever happened before. Chained and gagged in the courtroom. He was even kicked over in the chair in the courtroom when they, all they had to do was take him out of the court. 
uh, during that period. And so this is one is about a black man has no rights that a white racist political system is bound to respect. This was in New Haven, which I mentioned about when Bobby Seale was, they tried to murder him in the gas chamber. That's what it was about. And so I did this to bring attention to that issue. Hugh Newton didn't like this issue, but Bobby thought it was a very powerful picture that brought attention to his case at that time. This is when he, Bobby, and Huey were exonerated of the, uh, situ uh, uh, of the case in New Haven. And it says, hallelujah, the might and the power of the people is beginning to show. Unfortunately, this was in here again. This is showing my, our solidarity with the American Indian Movement, the original caretakers of the land. We aim was our uh, close allies. Uh, and I'm working on an image of Leonard Peltier, who is Ill, really ill now, uh, in support of Leonard Peltier. This is uh, Sonia Sanchez, well-known poet. This is her first poetry book. Uh, when she was out of San Francisco State, uh, she asked me to do uh, the uh, cover image for her first poetry book. This is a, like a remix of that, and again, another remix of it. This one I call Malcolm. That's Dr. King. This says, health is wealth. I like the saying, yeah, it's non toxic. <laughs> That's, uh, I call that Malcolm the Warrior. This is a sister who used to live in back of our headquarters. And every week she would come out and she would get her paper and read her paper. So I interpret that photograph of her. And I uh, paraphrase the words saying, it's a darn shame how the government won't give us the needy a helping hand. Here again is another one, a remix of one I did. And I got the brother here saying, here we are living in the land of plenty while we the people starve. Mm -hmm. It could be. It could be his brother. It could be his uncle. <laughs> yeah. But I'm going to get to some of this. I got some poli real political ones, too. This brother here used to come and buy his paper every week. He would be slushed. Uh, he would be slushed, but he would always come and get his paper at the headquarters every week. This is showing that uh, we were sharecroppers, and we were some of the same fields and same places that the, uh, the farm workers, uh, Latino Chicano farm workers work. They used to have the buses that used to come in the field more in the different areas to pick black people up, to take them to work in the farms on the summer all week long. Where were the farms, Where were the farms at? Uh, down in the valley, same place they are today. They used to go, yeah. Here's again, sharecropper. Here's a remix of the one you saw earlier. And it says, our struggles continues from one generation to the next. This one, Black Panther Party, October 1966, 1982. That's when we had to did a uh, uh, last, one of the, um, one of the last, one of, at this time, when I did this image was when we did a, a, a program that we had brought Panthers together. And, and it again shows all the different social programs. In Chicago, they gave them a, a, a Greyhound bus. They took the Greyhound off and put the Panther on it and called it the prison to prison, busing to prison program. And we had cars and stuff around the country where we would announce where you'd be at on, on the weekend. And we were going to certain prisons and anybody could come and go free to visit loved ones who were incarcerated in those, in those, in those prisons. In Winston-Salem there, you see that? We, have, we had an ambulance service. Because the ambulance, when Winston Salem was his first chapter in the South, they would, the ambulance was reluctant to come into the community or wouldn't come in. So the Panthers wouldn't got certified in the community to help buy them an ambulance. So we had a Black Panther Community Ambulance Service in Winston Salem. I call this uh, Educate to Liberate Freedom. This one was Tony Morris's book, uh, Bluest Eye, based on an uh, uh, ex exhibition on banned books. And what, this book was one of those was for censorship and what have you. A lot of people don't know over 100 some books have been either censored or banned in this, in this country. And so I t chose her book. And then last, it's about this young lady who mother thought she was going to be a, have a miserable life, didn't think she was a beautiful child and all that when she was born. And she went through life's journey Live psychologically messed up, living in this world, this make-believe world. And Essence, at the end, she was abused, raped, all those things. And at the end, 
Toni Morrison says she could have been assassinated, and that's what she said on the last page in, in the context of, of what she was speaking on. And that stuck with me that you didn't have to be assassinated by a bullet, but you can be psychologically assassinated. So that's what I was trying to share here with psychological assassination. Here's one done with uh, uh, reparations. It was a uh, Greg Moore Zumi, a brother who did a, a exhibit on Japanese American and African American reparations, and he wanted me to be included in that ex exhibition. And this is one of the images. This is the second image called reparations. The word spelled out and uh, with the chains, and as you see the letters spell the word reparations. And this symbol here is an African, I forgot the group, West African group symbol. And it, it, uh, it says, you are a slave whose handcuffs you wear. That's what the symbol represents. This is called freedom. This is a collaboration with Fabiana Rodriguez, Chicano artist, uh, when we did the uh, street uh, woodcut printing. And this is six, this one is about three and a half by seven feet tall and I uh, carved it and I wanted to use the word justice and resist unjust laws. Here's one set about peace. This is where I use fabric, African fabric in the back, remixed it. Here's something I had since the 1970s. I had never used it and I integrated it into this image. <laughs> and there's a remix of one I did. Here's one that's out of context, but you'll see it again. Uh, this is in Sao Paulo. This is early this year I had in Brazil at Sesi. I had a major exhibit there. I mean, this is a huge exhibit there. And this is just show you, but there's a couple of images. This one just happened to be out of context, unfortunately. I think it is. Here's the other one showing you different point. The one image to the right was some students from San Paulo University who came to the exhibition and were at the presentation. And they somebody like the Panther, and they were wearing the Panther uh, t-shirts. I also did a presentation at the university itself. This is a big wall picture of uh, one of the artists, one of the photographers who contributed uh, to the exhibit who used to follow us around. Uh, no, yeah, that was Lori Abernathy, the, the per, yeah. This is a Black Scholar magazine, uh, 1989. They had asked me to do an uh, uh, illustration uh, on the politics of the time. And as you can see, I have the elephant and the jackass eating out the same trough. <laughs> so ain't too much shame. Here's one I call toxic waste. Double-headed snake. I mean, that don't mean you don't have good people in there, but the culture and the system itself is so corrupt and so off. And people in there who got some, uh, who relevant, ain't, can't do nothing. They can't do nothing. So you, you, you got to talk about the issues of what it is. And you, now you got the Republicans attacking and beating up on the Democrats. Next you'll see the Democrats attacking and beating down on the Republicans. It's a toxic waste. This one says, real talk. Mama, why did President Obama pardon Leonard? Why did Obama didn't, why, Mama, why didn't President Obama pardon Leonard Peltier also? Sadly, because our government ongoing deep and extreme hatred, baby. That's the reality. It's because of hatred for the indigenous community, the original caretakers of this land. Fascist xenophobe. Commander in chief, that's Guantanamo Bay. That's a carryover from the Obama administration. Here's the word war in W-A-R. This symbol is a, like a Bantu symbol. When it's like this, that means war. But if it was going the same way, it would mean peace or solidarity. Here again, using that and uh, grown warfare, collateral damage. Where is Africa, Pakistan, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Africa. 
That's where you have all the uh, drone warfare going on. Here's one I talked about, didn't show earlier. When Obama went to get the Nobel Prize, he gave a war speech. He didn't give a peace speech. So that make him a Nobel fraud. When, now, during the work of the uh, government, he, they said, he, get to get, he got together every week with, I think, so many people, and they decided on who they were going to assassinate in the world. It's called the kill list. They had a list that they would talk about who they was going to kill in the world. But Nobel was a dynamite maker anyway. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. I'm glad yeah, to know that. Nobel is. <laughs> yeah. Now here we talk about war. War is devastating. War, war, this is what war does to human beings. That's devastating. That's a human Nobody being. Nobody can't win no war. I'm not, not, no, not no nuclear war. I don't care if the United States got 300 nuclear weapons. And the other country ain't got but 100. It'd be so devastating to this country, it, when I'm hit here, it'd be insane devastating. Can you imagine that what is happening with hurricanes? Can you imagine what's happening with all this other stuff that's going on, natural disasters, and can't deal with that? Can you imagine what's going to happen to the people here if there's a nuclear war? Genocide, deliberate killing of a large group of people, especially those of a particular ethnic group or nation. Who are the two people? I don't know if everyone knows who mm -hmm. both of those men were. Mm -hmm. Who are both of those men? Oh, that's Hitler and uh, mm -hmm. what's the name? Netanyahu. 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 Yeah. President of Israel, Prime Minister of Israel for uh, I don't know how many years. Yes. 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. This one, free the land by any means necessary. Boycott, divest. Down with apartheid. BDS, boycott, divest, sanctions. They're trying to stop this movement by any means they can, by just representing and distorting the information. Freedom of speech is being challenged because of that. Peace heals, war kills. I was contemplating the word peace, and I came up with, said, this is 2011, I think. And it says peace is being attacked. Peace can be attacked. Peace can be peace. Peace can be attacked. Peace is being bloody. Crimes against humanity. I did this initially before there was any discussions around the issue of what was going on in Yemen. Uh, and, and then I was able to wait until I got some relevant information. Then I began to integrate it into this artwork. And what was happening at first, the U.S. and the U.K. were denying, the British were denying that they were even involved in the surveillance of anything that was going on in Yemen. But the pressure began to mount till they acknowledged that they had been given the surveillance. They acknowledged that they were giving them military material and stuff to create the genocide that exists in Yemen today. I mean, you got uh, thousands injured, millions displaced, millions food insecurity, humanitarian, uh, humanitarian import blockade, thousands dead, water shortage, you got cholera, you got all this coming. Mother Earth, some people don't call it, don't believe in climate change, but it's something, it's something. Fract. Arab, Muslim, Islam, U.S. government's coded word for terrorist hate, discrimination. Black male, U.S. government's coded word for hate, discriminate, kill. As much as things change, some things stay the same. Why do they get to brutalize and, and murder us and we get to blame? Polish terror, USA. That was Oscar Grant era, right? Yes, this was when Oscar Grant, the initial one I did was when Oscar Grant was murdered. This one I call the Black Code. You had a slave code, Black Code. 
Emmett Till was clear because of the black slave code, you could say, black code. Talk in Switzerland, uh, I had a white woman. Uh, you had, slavery couldn't, you had to walk, when the white folks come on, you had to walk off the curb, couldn't look at them, all these kinds of things. Slave code, what, if you want to look at it from that perspective. And this says a black person has no rights, which an institutional racist judicial system is bound to respect. It gives the appearance of being fair and just when the biased decisions have already been made. And that's in the context of the, you can see that in the context of the, the non-verdicts and all the young people who have been murdered recently in this country. A black person has no rights that a white racist judicial system has ever been bound to respect. Legal lynching, then and now. Attorney General in USA. Black Lives Matter, Justice Now. Black Lives, Justice Now. That's what Black Lives Matter to me about justice. This is about justice, about the injustice. Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Love the Beauty, Life, Flowers, the Air, the Fresh Air, all that. That's what Black Lives is about. Down, uh, dare to struggle, dare to win. This is one I did, uh, collaboration with an Aboriginal artist. This is international stuff and stuff, travels now, with Aboriginal artist Richard Bell. This is in Campbelltown Center in Australia. Uh, it's about as long as this wall right there, about 16 feet. Uh, and uh, we did this one together. We collaborated on several times in Australia. As a matter of fact, I might be going back soon. Been there four times, and we each time to collaborate with Aboriginal artists. Uh, this is one, again, this a kind of picture of Albert, uh, Richard Bell there. This is a, a well known activist that was a part of a mural project that we were working on. And they wanted to use the reparation image because that's the color of the aboriginals there, red, black, and yellow. So, and they are still demanding reparations. They wanted to use, we did this one on John Carlos, Thomas Smith, and Peter Norman. A lot of people didn't know that Peter Norman was from Australia. And he was in solidarity with John Carlos and John Smith and Thomas Smith at the Olympics. He wore the uh, uh, Olympic badge that they had, Human Rights, for, Human Rights uh, Olympians for Human Rights, I believe it was. And when he went back to Australia, he still had the uh, fastest time for the 1972 Olympics, but they blacklisted him because he supported Thomas Smith and John Carlos, and they wouldn't allow him to run again in life. But after death, they want to acknowledge him. But, uh, but it, before that, they would demonize him, just like they were doing John Carlos and Thomas Smith here. And so we were asked to do this mural to enlighten and educate a lot of the young Australians, white Australians who didn't know that history. What city is that? Hmm? What city is this that? Is, this was here in Brisbane. And this was on a kind of a narrow street, but it was a narrow street where people come by all day long, coming from different work and young people who were doing some kind of a training program, and they would look and ask questions to us about it, what have you. These are my images uh, done, created by the Zapatista Mayan Women Collective in Chiapas. When we're in, in Chiapas, they did six uh, different uh, embroidery interpretations. I was invited to Caleb Duarte uh, to Idela Art Center, which was there back in, uh, which is not there now. And so these were, and we did some uh, work in the, in the community itself, as Zapatista community. This one. What's the significance of the Zampera Negra? Zapatera Negra was an all, Zapatera plays off of the uh, Zapatista, the Panthers, and showing how the aesthetics in both movements were inspiring to those movements. When we talked about it in the type of dress, style, talk, manners, all that being uh, arti artistic in that context. And so it was a whole movement, there was music, uh, a, mu a music called Zapatero. It was, there's a whole dynamics connected to Zapatera Negra. And you have a book. What's the name of your book that's out, particularly dealing with the Zap Zapatera Negra? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Embroidered. What are those on? Hmm? Those are on cloth? Yeah, those are cloths. They were embroidered. They had, uh, he had um, hand embroidered and machine embroidered combination. 
I think he said it took about two months, two, three months, because they had to take them to one location, then to another. This is when uh, we went there and we were invited to paint this, uh, this is like the auditorium at the, uh, at the school. And you know, the Zapatistas tend to love and care, but you have to bring all your paints. They can't afford you, you had to bring your paints, you had to bring your sleeping equipment, you had to bring everything when you go into areas to paint, uh, do work. And they allowed us, this is where they sent us to paint. And we had to sleep up on this platform here. This is open here. This is dirt floor, this is rough dirt here. You had to turn on my computer at night, bats, flies, and bugs would attack it. So I had to cut it off um, the whole bit. You had to go to the outhouse down in the back and out down the hill to his and hers. And so we were there for about a couple of days and, uh, and this is uh, what we were able to do in a couple of days with the paint that we had. Mm -hmm. And then next, I remember while there they took me, this is me standing in the store of the Zapatista store where we were supposed to come and paint. Uh, he was introducing me to some of the Zapatistas at this store that we would come back to paint. And uh, we're going back to, I think it was the next year. And this was a collective of us. This is a store. It's about 18 of us who contributed to the, uh, this, to the painting of the uh, store itself. Uh, and it was about solidarity, education, production, all those things that were the things that being created, included in the work itself. And as you see, these are Zapatista dials that were made for the uh, installation. That's them there. They're on or a part of the installation. This was my contribution, one of the images I contributed called Solidarity, Education, Production, Cultural. This is the other one, People of the Corn. So I did a star with the corn. Yeah, Ayo Zianapa, the 43 faith, uh, showing the solidarity with that issue. Uh, what does that mean? Hmm? What, does that, what does that mean? Uh, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the youngsters who were murdered in, uh, in, in the state of Guerrero, from the school in the state of Guerrero, missing. And the major uproars are behind the fact that the Mexican government lack of uh, interest in trying to find out what took place. And so the parents and the uh, students and everybody in Mexico has begun to have over a period of time and continue to demand uh, inquiries and investigation into what took place. I think it's even from, even to the UN today, I think it's also demanded, if that's worth anything. This is when I went to the school where the young brother here uh, was working in called Allendale Elementary School, the Tigers. This is when I was in Urbis in Manchester. These young people who were, were challenged uh, and uh, self-esteem, they did artwork that was also included in the exhibit. The exhibit here uh, in, uh, in Urbis in Manchester it was 2008. It went on from 2008, November, October to uh, April 2009. And they had over 43,000 people who came to that exhibit. And there's the showing you, she is showing you the exhibit itself. This was a major, huge exhibit. Uh, they had, we had, classrooms set up with desks, with books connected to it that were required reading by the Black Panther Party. So when people came in, they would read the same books that we were reading. You had audio video rooms. You had the visuals where they could sit down and look at visuals the whole bit. I mean, this was uh, a whole major exhibition. This was opening night. You said Manchester, England? Yeah, Manchester was Urbis. The location doesn't exist anymore. They changed it into a football, uh, something, but it, it was the major there. It was four floors of uh, what they did, exhibitions and kinds of stuff. Yeah. This is about three times as big as this here, whole thing. Here's when I went to uh, uh, Australia, New Zealand, to collaborate with the Maori artists, which I've been there three or four times. Uh, you, had a, you have a Polynesian Panthers, who were official chapter of the Black Panther Party in 1971. In Australia, I mean in New Zealand, you had Australia Panthers. Uh, you can see the uh, Polynesian Panthers uh, audio on video on YouTube. 
if you want to explore more. I, uh, and I was seeing this symbol because I was going to collaborate with Maori artists named Wayne Yule and Rigo 23, the artist from here, uh, and also from Portugal. And I seen the symbol, the uh, twist symbol. And uh, it's about, we may go different paths, but we always come back together. And I mentioned that to Wayne uh, through email. He said, oh, that's just a plain symbol. Yeah, there ain't nothing spectacular about it. And so I said, well, what am I going to do to make it have an impact? And so I put that symbol and I put the Maori flag together. And this is what I came up with as my design. And it says, uh, overcoming oppression is our path to unity. And uh, one of the brothers I knew, a Maori, uh, interpret that general interpretation in Maori as well. And also, uh, this is it. We, this is in South Auckland. This is like the hood. And this was at the Auckland International Art Festival. And what happened, you had a reporter who was out there. Because a lot of young people who in the hood would come through that shopping mall, and they would, we would engage with them and talk with them. And he happened to see that. And he was writing on the overall festival, which a lot of the other stuff was in you know, the galleries and the other areas. And he wrote that this was the best of the overall exhibit that year, because he seen all this interaction that we were having with the young people who were just coming through. And so they invited me back a, a year after that, where I did some other work with some young folks as well. But also, the, 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 the title of the a theme of it was, if we were to live here. And it came to me that if I was to live here, because I, then I went on, on YouTube and I, and I found out the, about the British flag. The British flag has always had to be at the top. The other flag has to be to the right, or the other flag has to be below. That's the way it has to be. So what I took, and I put the Maori flag at the top, made the British flag a little small and turned it upside down. <laughs> so that was right across the And they liked it. They liked it. <laughs> this is when I first went. I was there for 41 days invited. And, and this is at Elam International School of uh, Fine Arts. And this is on the streets near the university where they had put these images up. What city? Hmm? What city are we talking about? E uh, this is in Auckland, New Zealand. And so what happened is that uh, I was invited there for 41 days, but because the fact there was so much interest that they had to stop the artisan residency, myself and some of the artists talked and engaged each other while I, I traveled around the, the country, the North and the South Island, for 41 days talking about the history behind the art and the Black Panther Party. And there was so much interest until the point that uh, they couldn't, keep, couldn't, couldn't do it all. Couldn't do it all. They had to turn stuff away. I went to cultural centers, went to Marais, went to galleries. I mean, everywhere, everywhere there was this interest in, in the history and what have you. And so uh, it was powerful. It was amazing. It was really amazing. This is there when I met a Samoan school at, in, in, in uh, New Zealand also. And these are young artists. And I went into the classroom. They had pictures of jazz musicians that they were doing. They had pictures of, uh, of uh, Tupac. I mean, they, they, they were doing a little bit of everything, yeah. Here is at a library in, in New Zealand where youngsters were talking about some gentrification finna take place. And they wanted to do a mural around the fact that the land was being taken and what have you. So we would, I was just suggesting my ideas and on, that, on the possibility of what they could do. This is in uh, Argentina. Uh, this is when I went to Tri Marchi. It's a group for young people, uh, young artists. Uh, they come. Uh, these artists got together many years ago. They felt they didn't have any qualified instructors in Argentina. So they began to reach out and bring people in to talk about the arts who could teach them or help them. And this is at Tri Marchi in Mar del Plata on the coast. And they have from, from five to 7,000 young people at this major basketball stadium. They have two big screens on each side, as you see, about biggest, each of them as long as this wall or more. You have a, a professional uh, interpreter, and you give your, you know, give your presentation. 
And I gave my presentation, and after my presentation, uh, it was amazing, the response. Uh, you had young artists in the corridors of the art arena selling their art all the way around, outside you. OK, Kevin. So maybe um, close out your comments. And I have a couple of people who want to buy books and okay. kind of engage with you in a little bit less formal setting. OK. Thank you so much. OK. And so this is, uh, and so I wondered why it was there. It was so, and you have, you, this is where you had young people from Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay, El Salvador. I mean, they came from, they come from everywhere uh, to this conference. And they was, uh, it was like, it was amazing. And I was wondering afterwards, what was it? Why they, why, I got seven curtain calls. I was trying to figure out what was it that they liked about it. And it came to me that they could see in the artwork that I was talking about some of the issues that they were dealing with in their country. So the link was the art of resistance, the art of transcending art into an art form that deals with social issues and concerns. And uh, it was very powerful, very powerful. Yeah. Thank you so much, Emory.